the president and CEO of the New York Hall of Science. And, you know, the reason I think we have such a robust uh, response from around the world to this topic is because everyone has their own little piece of Einstein, their own memory, their own story, their own picture. We included a few of these in the promotional materials, but I would love to ask everyone before we jump into the discussion, I would love for everyone to share a word or two of your own association. Is it a statue you saw? Is it a movie? Is it uh, perhaps uh, the, the iconic uh, 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 picture of him that, that some people put on their socks, uh, which is ironic in its own sense because he didn't always wear socks. Uh, uh, we would love to hear from you. What's your association? Why the fascination with Einstein for you personally? Put some of those ideas in the chat. We'll uh, share. We have people calling in, I see from Portland, Oregon. Our, our favorite viewer from Kuwait is here, uh, Carlo. Uh, we have uh, people literally around the world. Um, uh, people are saying they love how intuitive that Einstein was, that he's a scientist, that he, a picture of Einstein playing the violin. He is a realized soul. We have people that relate to his spirituality, people that relate to his science, to overall to his humanity. But one thing not everyone knows is the intimate relationship indeed that Einstein had with one of my favorite institutions in Israel, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And that relationship started very much when he was alive and is continued with uh, the, the loving stewardship and continuity with an amazing pro project that actually brought together both Dr. Honey and, Dr. and Professor Gutfreund called Einstein Visualize the Impossible, which you will hear about more about over the course of our, our webinar today. Um, Professor Gutfreund, you could have just retired and sort of been a, a, a former president of a university, given a lot of speeches, written a lot of papers, but you decided to get your hands dirty and go back to the archives. So tell us a little bit about this relationship uh, that got you interested in uh, looking at the legacy of Einstein and, and, and revealing now to the world what some of the things are that you found indeed in his archives. What got me really interested it's twofold. First, when I served as the president of the Hebrew University, I realized that we have this unique cultural asset of immense importance to mankind. And I, when I stepped down from the presidency, I decided to devote the rest of my life to promote this legacy and to share this asset with the world. The other aspect, more deeper, more meaningful, is that when I was a professor at the university and for decades taught almost everything that Einstein discovered, I, only when I retired, I had the time to read the original papers, the documents, the letters, all of them in the archives. And for me, it was an eye opener. It suddenly dawned on me that when we teach, when we write textbooks, we are only interested in the process. But then I saw, we are only interested in the results, sorry. But then I saw that there is something in the process that we usually ignore. And I decided then to devote my life, tell my younger colleagues, tell students that there is a great importance also in the process. And that is what I am doing. Now, Albert Einstein was one of the founders of the Hebrew University. For him, the university was a combination of his Jewish identity, and the hope that the university will be a modern arena on which the values of Judaism, as he perceived it, the pursuit 
truth, pursuit of learning for its own sake, pursuit of justice, will come into prominent play in modern times. And therefore, it was only natural for him when he sat down to write his last will and testament to bequeath to the Hebrew University all his wealth. And his wealth is intellectual wealth. His wealth is what constitutes today the Albert Einstein archives at the Hebrew University. This is a collection of more than 80,000 documents which shed light on his passionate commitment to science and on his passionate commitment to humanitarian causes. You see, everybody knows that Einstein was a prominent scientist. But let me tell you that he expressed his views on every issue that was on the agenda of mankind in his time. And therefore, these documents are a unique source, a unique resource for anybody who is interested in the history of the first half of the first of the 20th century, who is interested in the evolution of ideas, who is interested in Jewish history at that time, who is interested in the beginning of the Hebrew University. We are sharing this asset with the world by numerous exhibitions, events, television programs, anybody who wants to do something around Einstein comes to us and we are ready to advise, to help, to share our expertise. And now, together with the American Friends of the Hebrew University, we are launching a very ambitious project. Initially, we intended to organize a traveling exhibition on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of his Nobel Prize. Because of the pandemic restrictions, this will not happen. And we have now changed it into something even more ambitious. We intend to launch a digital platform, a learning platform, for students, for parents, for the general audience, drawing on the ideas and values of Einstein. This will allow us to produce something more dynamic that will change. This will allow us to reach out to millions of people who will have the opportunity, will have the opportunity to converse with Einstein, to ask questions and to get answers. We are looking very much forward to the success of this event. This event, for this event, we have accumulated an advisory board, a group of illustrious individuals in the US, all of them prominent communicators of science. We are fortunate, I am grateful, that Dr. Margaret Honey is part of that group. I'm looking forward to work with her and the others on this ambitious endeavor. So I, I know we started to show as you were speaking, um, Professor Goitfriend, a few of I'll the come back to that. Yes. images. Okay, great. So um, Dr. Honey, um, tell us a little bit about why you decided to get involved with this project. Israel's a long way away from you um, in, in uh, New York from your facility, but what triggered your own imagination uh, to get involved specifically with a historic figure? Um, and given your focus and work with training uh, a next generation of, of, of students interested in science, how do you think Einstein's legacy contributes to that, your mission? So um, thank you, Wayne. First, it's a pleasure to be joining in this webinar today. And um, it's, it's wonderful to see all the people from all around the world who are gathered here with us. And, you know, I was thinking about this and <laughs> at one level, um, it's, it's hard to resist a man who says, I have no special talent. I'm only passionately curious. Um, 
And I think what um, what Hanuk was saying about um, you know the the legacy of process that Einstein has left the world. It's not just the legacy of product, but it is very much um, the legacy of a curious mind that um, we in this admittedly very ambitious, but also very exciting undertaking have a chance, I think, to bring to life. And the reason why I'm so passionate about that is, you know, I care, I care deeply and have spent my career um, engaging young people in opportunities to become passionately curious about the world and particularly through through the lens and through the tools and the the kind of methodologies that the scientific enterprise puts at our disposal and i've been doing i've been doing this work on the education side for a long time and you know i'm i've always been struck by um the degree to which we continue to kind of miss the mark um and i think um, this is particularly true in schools in the United States where, you know, science is sadly taught as kind of a memorization exercise, um, as a set of procedures that you have to master. And that happens at the K-12 level, it happens at the undergraduate level. It's probably only as you begin to um, make your way into graduate work and really sort of open up the box and understand that you know, science is an enterprise of kind of, um, you know, that is driven by people's passionate curiosities, if you like to go back to that. And I think that in, in celebrating this incredible milestone and extraordinary individual, we have an opportunity to bring to life, um, you know, both the, the, the genius that is Einstein, but even more importantly than that, the tools he used to engage in his work, to explore his passions and his curiosities. And I, I think we have an opportunity to really get people broadly engaged in the ways in which we need to sort of shift and shape and reshape and revisit the scientific enterprise. Um, that's what I would say in a nutshell. Okay, well, you certainly have an audience of curious people because they are, are literally um, uh, populating the chat with stories that date back to uh, 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 encounters in college for many of them uh, at Princeton University and, and at Vassar College and other places where he had associations. Um, and and I, I, I do think that um, um, this idea of, 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 of creating both curi curiosity and discipline around that with the various um, heart, you know, there's someone here talking about their first calculus class and, and you know, tying that curiosity to what it really takes uh, to be a scientist and to explore um, the hard hard work, which sometimes we know, unfortunately, young children are dissuaded from, or, or um, and in particular, um, uh, girls, um, that we know that we have to attract more and more into um, uh, these fields. So, Professor um, Gutfreund, I know you, I, I sort of feel like you've had this uh, uh, privilege of, of searching through the arc, searching through uh, the archive, obviously, mm -hmm. Of, of materials, um, could you maybe share what for you uh, are, are, are some of the most significant historic documents that you've come across uh, that, that sh tell us a little bit about this legacy? All right, I would like to, uh, to show, to share with our audience today. So I think the most important scientific document, not only in the archives, but maybe in modern science. And I would like you to show now with the background, the first page of Einstein's manuscript of his seminal paper on the general theory of relativity. 
Right. Now, the general theory of relativity is the achievement, Einstein's crown achievement, his masterpiece, after eight years of struggle, of wrong path, of many mistakes and failures, until finally in November 1950, 1915, he formulated this theory, which revolutionizes everything we thought that we understood about the universe. This manuscript and this theory is the beginning of a long odyssey of the exploration of our universe. Everything that we know today about the universe, how it started, how it evolves, what is its structure, is there. It is not mentioned there, but it follows from the equations that are there. Yesterday, we heard the announcement of the, this year's Nobel Prize in physics. It was something about these esoteric celestial bodies that call, are called black holes. Einstein did not believe in black holes. It was too soon, but they follow from these equations. And the announcement emphasized that what this Nobel Prize is given for, both the theoretical work to Roger Penrose and the observational dramatic results by Andrea Guess and Reinhard Geltzer, they all confirm again that Einstein was right. Now, let me say one thing about the manuscript. Because you see, if you are interested in the results only, then this was published. You can look it up in the book, you can look it up in the journal, and you know everything that is there. But still, manuscripts have a special value. They have a charm. They have an aesthetic and emotional appeal to us. They give us a sense of sharing, a virtual presence there, then, when it was done. But more than that, it shows us Einstein at work. It shows us what he erased. It makes us think why he chose this word and not the other one, which he ultimately erased. For historians of science, this is a treasure. Now, this is one of many such manuscripts that we have. They are all studied by historians of science together with the Hebrew University at the Einstein Papers project in Caltech. They are studied, edited, and published. They all shed light on how science was done in the formative years of modern physics. Well, um, how we go about teaching science um, and the, the, the fact that it's, it, it's studied today by um, uh, academics is, is, is a fascinating topic in and of itself. And I think there are, there, there are definitely a number of questions and comments uh, that we've seen from the audience that are asking about, you know, Dr. Honey, to your point about his curiosity and his approach essentially to uh, 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 topics. There's one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read one comment from Stephen who told a story, uh, uh, which is fascinating. I had not heard this. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll first do a, a, a fact check if, if, if it's a true story from uh, Professor Goodfriend, if he's heard it. The story is about Einstein meeting Hubble at the ob observatory and Mrs. Hubble saying to Elsa Einstein, my husband can see to the edge of the universe using the telescope, to which Elsa replied, my husband can do the same thing on the back of an envelope. So reality check, is that a true story? And Dr. Honey, can you translate what that may mean in terms of how he was a curious uh, 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 learner in ways that 
perhaps were different than others or, or perhaps that um, uh, that we can learn from today as, as uh, uh, Professor was explaining. So is it a true story, Professor Goodfriend? We have many examples in the archives of back of the envelope calculations by Albert Einstein. So it's very likely to be true. Okay. So to me, the interesting, um, the interesting piece about that story is these were two uh, extraordinarily talented men working with very different tools that were at their disposal and tools that allowed them to conceptualize a phenomena in, uh, in, in ways that use different methods and different techniques and strategies ultimately to get to similar objectives. And I think, um, you know, as we set about doing this work of bringing Einstein's legacy to life sort of digitally, as Professor Goodfriend described, we, we have an opportunity to shed light on the processes and practices of science. Um, through, you know, through the lens, through the story of this uh, extraordinary individual. And, and why is that important? Um, it's, from my vantage point, um, it's important because we, we have an understandable, but also, I think, very kind of naive and limiting notion that science exists only to deliver truths and certainties. And in fact, um, you know, science does sometimes deliver truths and certainties, as we know, um, but science also delivers importantly, um, and I would argue probably even more importantly, ways of knowing that enable us to advance the enterprise of understanding, right? And, um, you know, we can, we can see that very clearly and very immediately as the science around COVID-19 has played out in front of our eyes. And, you know, at, at different points in time, scientists' assertions about the best things to do, how those translate into public health practices has changed, as it should, as it should. Science is not a stagnant enterprise. And I think, um, you know, I think we often conflate from an education point of view, the desire, and I've like, like all of our guests on this webinar, we've all experienced wanting science to deliver us a truth, whether, you know, it's a, a cure for a kind of cancer or, you know, a way to eliminate heart disease or some other, you know, really terrible illness that we've had personal experience with. Um, those desires are real and important, but we, we conflate our desire for certainty, for truth, in how we go about teaching science. And sort of that's where, um, you know, that's where I've spent, and, and many other people have spent their time in trying to sort of shift science from being an activity of kind of memorization and, and fact knowing to um, a set of processes and principal practices through which you can use different kinds of tools whether it's the back of an envelope or a Hubble telescope, right, to, to undertake your disciplined inquiry. And I think, um, you know, I think like, you know, when we think of Einstein, of course, we, we think of the, um, the extraordinary theory of relativity. And um, I think part of what Professor Gutfreund is saying in showing us that manuscript is that we have an opportunity to bring to life, not just the genius of this individual, but kind of the, the intimacy, if you like, of the processes and practices and strategies he deployed to get there. Um, you know, what we get to ask questions like, 
what made him passionate. Um, all of those kinds of things, I think, can be can be brought to life in a way that, for all of us, helps to enrich how we think more holistically and more forgivingly, if you like, about the scientific enterprise. Hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm really, uh, I, I definitely want to come back to your point, your initial point about the collaboration and its uh, uh, relevance for our, 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 our current moment. Um, uh, I am, and by the way, while, while we've been speaking, we already have confirmation from a National Geographic um, uh, uh, publication about the Hubble story. Um, but there are a, a, a number of questions, uh, 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 Professor Goodfriend, that go back to you know the 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 essentially the biography of 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 Einstein and the fact that he had to overcome uh, learning dis, uh, difficulties in his uh, early age in order to pursue his passions. Um, is there anything that you could uh, uh, comment uh, on on that, that that touches on that from the archives and and maybe in particular even his his magnetism toward children and interest in children? There are many myths around Einstein. One of the myths is that he had difficulties as a child of learning, that he was a late speaker and all that. There is no evidence for that. Mm. It's true that he did not get along very well with his teachers in the school in Munich, in Germany. He could not accommodate the German almost militaristic discipline that was practiced also at all levels in the, uh, in the educational system in Germany. Uh, you see, we have a picture which I should have shown you, of his class in Munich. There are about 40 young boys, there are only boys there, very stern, very severe, very serious faces, all of them, what, 10, 11, 12 years old. There is only one boy there who is smiling, and that is little Albert. So he was having fun as a kid? <laughs> so he did not, he did very well when he left the German school and he did very well in the Swiss educational system and he was a bright student. Uh, now I know you do have uh, some, some uh, letters in the archives of, uh, that show his special appeal to young people. Uh, could we maybe, uh, could you comment on that? That was, that was a later, um, when he was much older. Children corresponded with Einstein. Children loved Einstein and he loved children. And we have we have this correspondence with children. This is a very unique letter from this little girl of six, Anne Cochin, who writes of Einstein that she saw his picture uh, in the papers and he should have a haircut to, to look better. But there are many others. You can, you can see uh, children uh, give him advice, children asking questions. Here, these young boys are interested. They all know that he is a genius, so they ask Einstein if he considers himself a genius. Many of them ask him questions, and you can see where that comes from. You can see this uh, uh, young boy and girl asking their father or mother busy in the kitchen, kitchen or elsewhere some uh, some questions and they tell him why do you bother me go and ask Einstein and they do that and as far as we know Einstein took those letters seriously he responded unfortunately we do not have those answers okay um the uh, uh... There, is, there is by the way a charming letter from this young girl who tells him that she is very frustrated because she has uh, problems with her mass. Oh, keep that. I will explain that in a moment. <laughs> uh, that I will explain in a moment. Uh, but then she tells him that uh, 
she has problems with her mass. So uh, he tells her, look, don't worry about that. I can assure you that my problems with mass are even greater than yours. <laughs> that we have the answer. Now, this is a very interesting letter. This young man writes to Einstein and he tells him, look, when we are on this globe, that on the North Pole, we stay upside, up. On the South Pole, we are down. And he asked Einstein, maybe this is when we are down, then we do such foolish things as falling in love. And to that Einstein answered in his handwriting in German, you have here his handwriting above that picture and he tells him that he does not think that falling in love is the most foolish thing that people do, but gravity cannot be held responsible for that. So, so we, we, we know that, that Einstein had, um, um, uh, he's very quotable, right? We've seen him quoted on sweatshirts. We've seen him quoted uh, um, uh, on, on many pop and, and contemporary um, items today that is part of uh, the legacy. Um, we do have a number of people who have written in to, to say curio curiosity alone won't do it. Right, we all have our curiosities, but how do you convert the curiosity, particularly Dr. Honey, with young people in the STEM fields? How do you then turn that into a more disciplined practice so that they uh, then become lifetime learners, pursue uh, 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 fields of study that that could allow them at at a, at a young age uh, to learn math, to go into physics, etc. Et, et, et long, you know, the, the long path it takes before. Uh, one gets to uh, a Nobel Prize. Right. So uh, I, I'm seeing a lot of those comments, Wayne, as well. And um, someone writes, surely curiosity is key, but is insufficient in itself. Also needed our genius in seeing relationships where others have not, and the persistent hard work to achieve a scientific conclusion. And um, both of those are, are so, I think, very accurate and perceptive. But I would also say it's not just genius. You need opportunity. And I think, um, you know, how you, how you create opportunity for young people to look at the world through lenses that you wouldn't normally sort of put together is is a big question and um and, and a big important question um we you know we we have sort of evolved both methods of teaching and i would also say kind of methods of parenting where you know the the end goal um, takes precedent over, often over how you get there. You know, are you going to win the science fair prize or, um, you know, produce the most amazing robot for the robotics challenge? There's a lot of process in those things, but we, I've seen this again and again and again in my career that it's the, it's the out product, the output that's evaluated rather than the thinking you do along the way. And I think, you know, we, for whatever reasons, Einstein was remarkable at being able to connect things that to many of us would feel disparate and disconnected. And that is, a, if you like, a kind of genius habit of mind. But it's also, um, you know, it's also a practice that from a very kind of pragmatic point of view, we can actually foster and nurture. So I'm reminded by a story um, I once heard a, a, a man named Adam Chayer um, tell, and Adam was the co-inventor of Siri. We all know Siri. Um, and he, he was actually doing an event for us um, connected with the Hall of Science. And... 
um, in the Q&A section from the audience, somebody had the brilliant idea to say to him, so how did you come to be who you are, right? And he told this really wonderful, charming story of um, his, his mother and his parents more broadly being um, the time he grew up, not too keen on television. Um, and his mother would save up or go get lots of card, cardboard boxes and put them down in the basement and then sort of send Adam down there. No instructions, no, you know, here's what you're going to do, Adam, for the next hour. Just go play. And he built worlds and things he was interested in. He had an opportunity to explore that process of kind of invention and connection and thinking about bringing together the disparate to create something he wanted in, in a way that was very open-ended and imaginative. And I, I, I think there's a lesson there because um, in this day and age where, you know, we're really, we're really focused, many of us, on um, making sure that, you know, our, our children possess all the right skills. So on the heels of that same event, I remember a, a, one of our guests coming up to me and saying, you know, Adam's story was so compelling, but, you know, there, there are children in my, my eight-year-old's class that already speak five different languages, and I've got to make sure my child can compete against them. Like that, that was her dilemma. And I think, you know, we've, We've we put a lot of emphasis on end product without understanding the importance of process. So it's a theme I keep coming back to in this conversation because is it enough? No, but um, to leave it out and to simply teach any discipline, um, whether it's history or science or religion, any discipline, even mathematics, really, as just a, just a set of strategies that one needs to master, is, is a, it's, we're selling ourselves short. We're, we're not creating the opportunities that children need to surface the, the kinds of genius not necessarily Einstein genius, but there's genius that, that lives in everyone. And you have to create the space and conditions to enable that to happen. So, you know, very practically, send your children down to the basement with a bunch of cardboard and see what happens, right? Stop, stop hovering. Don't tell them what to do every step of the way. Like, create some freedom. Because it's, I think, I think, you know, part of the, crisis we're in, certainly in the States, is the fact that it is born in part of the fact that we haven't had enough opportunity to exercise and develop our intellectual curiosities in ways that make us question. So. Well, that's really a, a, a profound thought. Thanks for, for, for sharing that. And indeed, we, you know, it, it, it's interesting to watch the, um, <laughs> There, there's an array of views about, um, uh, uh, understandably, about uh, the pedagogical takeaways, uh, both from Einstein and in uh, how we identify and nurture geniuses who are truly geniuses, and then the rest of us who uh, maybe have a, a moment of inspiration or imagination uh, that could lead uh, to something um, um, more significant. Um, and, and, and again, per, you know, respectfully, Professor uh, Goodfriend, I, you've had to hear both the myths, as you referred to, as well as um, uh, uh, look at the legacy from academic study of other people around the world. What, 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 what would you share on this? Now, I would like to follow up on what Margaret uh, just said, what she observed. So you see, Einstein, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, was 21 years old. He just graduated from the university, was desperately looking for a position to make a living for him and for the family that he was about, that he wanted to establish. 20 years later, 
He has completely revolutionized our understanding of the physical world. He got the Nobel Prize. And 100 years later, he became the man of the century. Now, in the first five years of that century, you see, when he came into this world of science as a graduate student, physics was in a crisis. Classical physics could not explain many of the observations of the experiments of the new understandings. They were giants of physics that were struggling with all these problems. They knew everything and even more than Einstein did. How did it happen that this young man, not working at a university, fully employed as a clerk in a patent office, everything that he did, he did in his free time. In five, within five years, the first five years, until the miraculous year, he solved all those problems single-handedly. What did he see that others did not? He saw everything that they did, but he was not committed to dogmas. They were all very reluctant to give up the success the experience, the teachings of 250 years of classical physics since Newton. He had no respect for any authority. And that is what helped him. <laughs> now, another thing that I would like to emphasize in what Margaret uh, mentioned, and that is, you see, she emphasized, as I did at the beginning, the importance of the process. I don't know how many of our listeners, and I'm sure not many of my colleagues, realize that Einstein, I don't know of any other scientist of that status who published so many wrong papers as Einstein did. And that does not diminish from his greatness. There are papers with wrong assumptions and wrong paths and wrong, and even, even the, uh, errors in calculations. So you see, in our education, the tolerance of failure is a very important element. And that is one of the lessons that we can also draw from Einstein. Um, one, one of the early questions that came in, uh, Dr. Goodfriend, was about mentors uh, that Einstein may have had. Do we know that from, from the archives? There is. I don't know what, what the, was referred to. He did have, and that is a very important episode. He, when he was 12 years old, and he was student in the Catholic school in Munich, his Jewish but assimilated parents wanted to compensate for that. And they invited to live with them a young biblical student, Max Talbot, to teach little Albert in the basis of Judaism. Initially, he was very successful because Albert wanted his parents to observe Shabbat and, and keep a kosher home. And that was the last thing that they wanted. But that mentor, and he was a mentor, that mentor made a mistake, but maybe in retrospect, a great service to the education of little Albert, because he gave him books in popular science. And there Albert could read even about space travel about all the innovations in science. And he was really enchanted. And he suddenly realized that the stories that one reads in the Bible cannot be true as they are taught. And that, as he writes in his autobiographical rock, uh, notes, he refers, by the way, to that period and to that mentor as a religious paradise of youth, but that had a profound effect on him. 
that generated this disrespect for authority which accompanied him throughout his life. So what I, I, I do want to get, we, we have questions that cover so much different territory here that, that yeah. probably we'll have to compile uh, them afterwards and, and share them with the panelists to, um, uh, uh, to get back. To but there is one here about Einstein in pre-war Berlin and his sort of humanitarian uh, instinct and interests. Uh, the comment says that he uh, was chair of the OSE in pre-war Berlin. Can you share any insight on how he helped German Jewish children in pre-war Germany? That this is a side that, that's not often talked about. What he did, you see, in pre-war, um, pre-war, Einstein came to Germany after he spent some time in Zurich in 1914. 1914, World War I breaks out. Germany invades Belgium. There are 93 professors at universities, intellectuals, who publish a manifesto applauding the German government for that move claiming that this is the most noble expression of German tradition and history. Einstein and two others, but Einstein was the leader, stepped then down from his ivory tower of a scientist and became an involved politician in politics. And he published an appeal to the Europeans deploring German militarism. And that, of course, made him a target of political assault, of blunt anti-Semitism, and that was his share as long as he stayed in Germany. Well, um, yeah, uh, uh, define, a uh, scientist defying authority um, and, um, and using that for his own uh, curiosity. Uh, uh, and as you said, for some papers that resulted in uh, either mistakes or, or, or not, not breakthroughs, but, but nonetheless that, that gave him that uh, po possibility, um, you know, to, to freely explore uh, and and to, to see where that would take him in science. Dr. Honey, I, I, I know your involvement and your other colleagues that are on the advisory board now for this uh, Visualize the Impossible are really uh, an effort uh, to make sure that Einstein, um, his legacy is relevant for future generations. And I know where you work on a day-to-day -day basis, you're very focused on, on children and, and, and kids what, what, what are you seeing um, and what do you hope will happen as we begin to uh, move toward the 100 year uh, anniversary of, of, of the, the Nobel Prize uh, speech that he gave? Well, I think, um, you know, again, in this project, we, we have an opportunity to um, surface sort of Calls it, call it ways of working and ways of thinking, if you like, so that Einstein is brought to life, not just as a genius and somebody who was, you know, really good at coming up with those phrases that would make your head turn because they were, they were, they were evocative. And, and it's interesting um, that Hanuk points out the degree to which he questioned authority. I think I think probably what must underlie that is a desire to like always invite people to think, right? And to, um, to wonder, to be curious, to poke and provoke. And I think, I think if we do this work well, um, we can not just bring some of those stories to life, but we can design experiences. I mean, the wonderful thing about working in a digital medium is you have tremendous flexibility to design forms of engagement 
that can emulate those kinds of processes and practices um, and do that well and invite not just one way of solving a problem, but multiple ways of solving a problem. So to, you know, in our, in the work we do at the Hall of Science, we, we really think a lot and work very hard on designing experiences that we say are intended to give every learner a foothold, every learner a sense of, oh, I can be good at this. And one of the ways in which you do that is you don't, you don't box people in. There isn't one way to solve a problem. Good mathematicians know this, right? Good scientists know this. Good teachers know this. There, there are multiple ways. And I think that's so important for young people because if you're a learner that doesn't, you know, the, the algorithm that you've been given to use by your teacher to solve X problem just doesn't make sense for, to you. You can't unpack it. You should be given an opportunity to devise a strategy and use tools that will resonate with you. That's, you know, somebody in the chat said, you know, how do you unleash the genius in all of us? And I do believe there's genius in everyone. Um, again, not not Einstein genius, but there is genius in all of us. And I think, I think one of the ways in which you do that is by inviting um, and encouraging young people to engage in processes of learning that include the importance of, of, of failure, that include the try, try again sort of strategies that are so critical in all disciplines, but particularly in the scientific enterprise. Professor Goodfriend, could you share, uh, uh, Sarah and some other questioners have asked about the specifics of this Visualizing the Impossible project. I know you mentioned uh, uh, that young people would actually be able to put questions to Einstein uh, in, in, in some way. Uh, that seems like a nice continuity of his legacy of answering kids' uh, letters. How's that gonna work? Well, this is, these are the secrets of modern technology. We are fortunate. We have a partnership with a very professional, highly experienced company, Code in Theory, and the design and the presentation. This will be their challenge. And my first impressions with the meetings that we have, with the discussions that we have, that uh, we have selected them from several other companies. There was a tender, and I'm confident that we made a very good choice, and I look forward. They will know how to do that. I have Doc Dr. Honey, from your perspective, working in, in, um, as a science educator, what, what are the kind of things that we can expect you know, in the coming decade? What, what's going to look different about science education that, that maybe even Einstein himself would be surprised to find? Um, wow. Well, that, that is a big question, Wayne, um, because science education has looked pretty similar for, for many decades. I, I think, um, you know, here's another story which has always stuck in my head. I, I had worked with the National Academies and produced a report called something like um, Integrated STEM Education. And there were a group of, of elementary age students working on a project in Hillsdale, Oregon, school district. And somehow they got a hold of this report and they decided, I was the person to call up an interview. And they, I, so I said, I mean, how are you going to resist being interviewed by a group of fifth graders? Um, so of course I said yes. And, um, and they, they, they brought their problem to my doorstep. And the problem they were trying to solve was that when they were little, these were fifth graders. So when they were little, the science they learned in school was all hands-on. It was all about exploration. It was all about discovery, right? They learned in the context of doing things. 
And they were exceedingly dismayed that now they were older, fifth graders. Science didn't look like that anymore. It was all about the textbook. It was all about memorization. So their project was to change that trajectory within their school district. And so I thought there was remarkable wisdom in these four, they happened to all be young men, little boys, um, because they, they were calling out a very fundamental problem. We, we let go too soon in the teaching of science what is really important to the, the processes of learning that the scientific enterprise is based on. And if we don't allow that kind of hands-on discovery-based joyful learning to proliferate in classroom environments, we're going to keep selling ourselves short. So it's, it's not that complicated a thing to do. It's just we, we need the will and, and, um, and we need, um, you know, we need, we need the practices that help teachers develop the skills and confidence to be able to do that, that kind of work. That's great. That, 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 that's a great mission for, for us to think about collectively and to advance. Professor, good friend, I'm going to give you the last word as we wrap up. Um, uh, you know, for, for, first of all, congratulations on, on, on this project. We're, we're really excited and we will be watching it very closely. And, and the, the group that's putting together this 100 year celebration. Um, but what about the 200 year celebration? 100 years from now, God willing, what would that, what will Einstein's legacy look like 100 years from now? Will we still be talking about the theory of relativity? If we succeed in our project, then Time Magazine will make him the man of the 21st century. Okay, so let's hope Time Magazine is still around then. That's, a, that, that's probably the bigger question. But let me, but um, let me give some, some remarks, uh, concluding remarks. Sure. Because there was a question that we started with and we did not elaborate on that. And this is a why is Einstein still so much alive? And why is the general public, I'm not speaking about the, the community, the scientific community, so much still interested in Einstein? Because usually when people die, um, even if they were popular, their memory recedes into history. They have a place in the pantheon of science, but the general public, who knows? And with Einstein, it seems to work the other way around. My experience, everybody's experience is that the, as time passes from his death, the interest, the public interest only increases. Why is that? Now you see, we, one, we are tempted to say that is because of his greatest, great achievements. I don't think that that is enough. Take, for example, a man like Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was the greatest innovator, not less than Einstein, in life sciences, the father of immunology, the founder, the discoverer of certain vaccines and all that. How many people in the street, when you show them the picture of Pasteur, will recognize him or even know who he was? With Einstein, it's exactly the other way around. He is the most recognizable face across continents, generations, ages. And it is an interesting question on which we could elaborate. I don't have time now. How come that he became such an iconic figure it's not only his science. It is his public appearance. It is his special, the way he, his conduct. It is the fact that his, that his hair was always in disarray. It is a certain disrespect for social, for uh, um, 
for, for, for social appearance, when he goes to President Roosevelt to deliver him the special, this letter on the atomic bomb, he goes without socks. And when people tell him, why do you go to a president not wearing socks, he says that I reached an age when uh, if I don't want to wear socks, I don't have to wear socks. Almost the Charlie Chaplin of science. And still a great, a great innovator. And I believe, to answer your first question, his memory will be with us in the next hundred years. In 2008, after the great biography of, by Walter Isaacson on Einstein, a scholar wrote a very favorable review, but then he said that too many books on Einstein. There should be a moratorium. Let me tell you, since 2008, you can look on Amazon, you will find that more than 80 books appeared on different aspects of Einstein. And this will continue. Thank you so much for that, that, that touch point um, and this uh, invigorating conversation, frankly, at a time when um, we all know the importance of science in our day-to-day -day, uh, challenges that we're dealing with with uh, the pandemic, uh, the American-Israel Friendship League has been doing these type of webinars now for the past seven or eight months, bringing together some of the finest minds in both Israel and the United States to talk about how we forget about the pandemic a little bit now and then, but also about what it is going to take for us, not just to collaborate, but to innovate and solve problems that are real, that impact on people. And we are so grateful to have both the two of you and to learn about this project. We will share links about the project in subsequent communications to all the viewers here and to people in our network, because we think this is something not only worth celebrating, but about learning about. And for all of you that have been joining us either for the first time today or have been a part of our webinar series over the past eight months, we're doing these twice a week. We're doing them because we think people need to be inspired by science. We think people need to be inspired by what happens when you bring together uh, people to collaborate over the Atlantic and in different parts of the world. We're also uh, doing this um, 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 you know, on, on a wing and a prayer. And so we need your, your financial support as well. One of our board members who is a scientist and physician, Dr. David Milch, actually gave us a very generous uh, uh, challenge uh, and said to us, he will, his foundation in New York will match every dollar, shekel, peso that we can collect um, uh, during the month, during the fall, uh, in, in order to advance this webinar series. So we ask any of you that, that have uh, uh, had a taste and seen a little bit about the the programs that we're running. We can't bring people physically together at the moment as we normally do and have done for 49 years, but we hopefully will continue to spark these conversations and continue to build relationships and friendships uh, despite the challenges that we're facing. So everybody, um, please uh, 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 let people know about our series, share it with them, it's free. We, we want more visitors and more followers and for now, we wish everybody a safe and, and, and very happy and sweet new year. And uh, appreciate your being here with us for this very important discussion. Thank you again to our panelists. Cheers and l'chaim. Shana tova. Shana tova.